Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning uh, for Scientific Cameras 101, Technology and Selection Criteria. My name is Jason Mills. I'm the General Manager here at Door Lab Scientific Imaging. Uh, today, Martin Parker, our Director of Engineering, will be presenting out. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So if you do have any questions um, during the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A function in here to submit your questions uh, and we'll do our best to get to all the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, I appreciate everybody taking the time to join us this morning and I will now pass it off to Martin Parker uh, to per, uh, begin the review. Thanks Jason. Uh, thank you everybody uh, out there, guests and colleagues uh, for attending. And a special thanks to the Thor Labs uh, sales and marketing team, um, graphic artists, uh, camera engineering team. Appreciate all of your support. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of material here. Uh, we'll get started right now. Um, this presentation is basically um, broken up into three parts. There's an introductory part that introduces some of the camera technology, a little bit of the physics that goes on. Uh, my goal here is to really leave you with some kind of imagery and concepts um, to to help understand what happens inside a digital camera and some of the um, uh, processing and other uh, components that are in, in a digital camera. The second part of it will be about uh, selection criteria. If you're uh, considering purchasing a scientific digital camera, um, you know what factors and criteria uh, might you need to um, uh, consider um, in in, in your purchase. And then the third part uh, will be some of our core competencies uh, here at Thor Labs, both in the uh, camera group and also uh, elsewhere in Thor Labs that are relevant to cameras. So let's get started. First, a little introduction to Thor Labs uh, scientific imaging. So we're a business unit of Thor Labs. We're located in Austin, Texas. Uh, we were acquired <clears throat> in November 2011, and our product lines are scientific CMOS or CCD and scientific CMOS digital cameras. Uh, the CCD digital cameras are really going obsolete because of changes in the industry. CCD manufacturers no longer, um, at least the major ones, are no longer uh, manufacturing CCDs. Everything's shifting over towards CMOS for the most part, and we'll talk a little bit more about the reasons why. Uh, our cameras are designed and manufactured in the United States. We have monochrome color polarization sensitive um, image sensors. We range really from the visible to the near IR. Um, there is a lot of work that goes on in near IR in life sciences, material science, et cetera. And we also bundle a considerable amount of software uh, to promote uh, connectivity uh, for a variety of different disciplines. So we have, of course, our ThorCam camera application. Uh, we have an SDK, you know, essentially the lower level software to connect to our cameras. Uh, we have a native C, you know, a traditional C interface, C -sharp .net, which is Windows only, Python, which is becoming much more popular. Um, and we also provide our color and polarization image processing libraries. On top of that, we have third party interfaces, LabVIEW, MATLAB, MicroManager, which is really popular in the life sciences uh, for my microscopy systems. Um, and we have both win Windows and Linux uh, SDK offerings. So let's move on to the camera and sensor basics. And first, let's look at what's inside a Thor Labs scientific imaging uh, digital camera. So as you might expect, there's a lens mount for C-mount lenses, which we provide with uh, most of our cameras, not all of them. Um, one of them, we provide a C and a um, um, uh, related C-mount um, lens mount. These lens mounts are removable, and behind them then there's threading for our SM1 one-inch uh, tube systems. We also offer four mounting holes for our cage mount rods. So essentially these cameras can be integrated into any Thor Labs um, you know, mounting system as well as post mounts. So if we consider an imaging system where there's a lens in front of it, which is not always the case, the image will then be projected upon the image sensor. The image sensor is composed of generally millions of uh, you know, microscopic uh, photosensitive um, 
uh, pixels, which measure the amount of light that's falling on them that gets turned into a digital value, which is then um, trans uh, transmitted to what we call the platform board. It's then picked up by a processing FPGA. This FPGA takes that data, deserializes it, or essentially reorganizes it. There are a couple of processing stages that are selectable by a user. Um, and then that data is moved into a buffer memory. The reason we have the buffer memory is um, occasionally the delivery of the data or the acceptance of the data from the computer can be interrupted by other processes on the computer. And so we need a place to store the data temporarily uh, until such time as that, uh, that bus stall or other interruption is cleared. From there, the data comes out goes into a USB 3 controller, and this device takes the data and essentially reformats it, reorganizes it into, um, into packets and into signals that are compliant with the USB 3.0 standard. From there, out through a connector, out to the cable, and out to your computer. And this is a pretty typical architecture for digital cameras. It's you know, a kind of common sense architecture and one you would find in cameras from other manufacturers as well. So let's now move to sensors. Um, you know, many of you may have heard of CMOS sensors and CCD sensors, and we get a lot of questions. Um, you know, what's the difference between them? Which one should I choose? Which one's better? Uh, so I, I want to I want to point out in a way the similarities and differences, and you know, the trends that eventually led to the supplanting of CCD sensors with CMOS. So first let's look at the similarities between the two. Both of them have an array of photo detectors or pixels that are fabricated in silicon. Both of them exploit the photoelectric effect to generate free electrons. The photoelectric effect is a fundamental interaction between uh, matter and light where incoming light can strike, let's say a photon can strike an atom of some material. Um, that energy can be imparted to that atom. And if the energy is sufficient enough, boost an electron from one energy state to an elevated energy state. And in silicon and in other uh, materials, when that electron is boosted to the higher energy state, that electron is then freed to move around in the crystal lattice. And this is an important thing because essentially the number of electrons that you free up and collect is proportional to the number of photons that struck it. And I want to point out too is an important characteristic of silicon, silicon which is the absorption coefficient. And it's really responsible for the overall spectral sensitivity, you know, the, the change in, in sensitivity relative to wavelength of CCD and CMOS sensors. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you look at this curve, you can see that as the wavelength increases, um, the transparency um, increases dramatically or the absorption decreases dramatically. And that's an important uh, consideration as we, as we look further. And then finally, both of them use charge transfer to move electrons that have been col collected to another location for measurement. And so, you know, eventually we have to count these electrons somehow. And so what we do is move them to an electrometer, essentially a capacitor, where the number of electrons um, produces a voltage that's proportional to the number of electrons. And we'll, we'll see more about that later. So next, let's look at a pixel. So what we're gonna see is a typical pixel that's more or less similar in a CCD and CMOS sensor. So this diagram or these diagrams are cross sections of a pixel. So this would be, you know, on the order of microns um, in its dimension. It's a cross section through the pixel. And what we're looking at is uh, electrostatic potential. You know, you can think of it as, let's say, kind of like a voltage or an electric field. 
And this region here is of higher potential and this is of lower potential. This is a static potential and it's introduced into the silicon by driving what are called dopants into the silicon and they can be implanted using an ion implanter that literally shoots these, um, these dopants in or they can be diffused in by, by other means. And um, dopants are generally um, elements that are close to silicon in the periodic table. Uh, some of them add electrons, some of them have a deficiency of electrons, donors and acceptors, and really they're essential to creating any kind of usable, um, you know, electronic solid state device. So what can be done is basically the, there can be controlled introduction of these dopants in a controlled fashion such that you can create these static electrostat uh, electro, uh, electrostatic potential profiles. Um, you can turn off the device, these profiles will still be here and they play in a very, very important role um, in the collection and movement of electrons. So let's see what happens when a photon strikes this pixel and we'll start with um, a very short wavelength, at least from, from a visible light perspective, let's say something in the violet. So here comes a photon in the violet and it immediately creates, um, it strikes a silicon atom it creates an electron hole pair. A hole basically refers to the vacancy produced when an electron is freed up. If it's freed up and it's moving about, it's leaving behind a vacancy where it once was. And holes can essentially move around in the silicon lattice too, more or less like the electron can move around. Um, and what we wanna do is we really wanna separate the electron from the hole because if we don't, they'll likely recombine. The electron will drop, it'll release its energy and drop back in and fill the vacancy. So we wanna get them apart as soon as possible. And that's really what this electro, uh, electrostatic potential does. It allows us to separate the electron from the hole. The holes are swept away um, and the electrons uh, basically are attracted to this area of more positive electrostatic potential. Now let's look at what happens if we go to a shorter wavelength, green. Well. The, the absorption coefficient of silicon is less in green. And so the green on average is going to penetrate deeper into the silicon. It'll cre still create electron hole pair, most likely. Um, and a similar behavior will happen. They're, they're influenced by the electric field successfully. We go to red, even deeper still on average. Some red photons might penetrate even deeper than this. But again, you know, they're under the influence of the electric field and they get collected. So now we've sequestered these electrons. We've kept them from recombining with the holes and now we can eventually measure them. But let's see what happens with an even longer wavelength. It, let's say 1100 nanometers. Well, now silicon is becoming very, very transparent. Um, if an electron hole pair is even produced, uh, it'll be produced deeply into the silicon. And now we're starting to get outside the influence of the electric field and these can wander about, they can recombine, the electrons can be swept up, let's say an adjacent pixel and um, you know, ultimately most of them will be lost. And so the result of that is really this characteristic spectral response curve that CC CCD and CMOS devices um, follow for the most part. They all have this kind of characteristic shape where the efficiency of the collection or the generation of electron and hole pairs goes down with wavelength. And eventually the wavelength is so long that the photon doesn't have enough energy to even produce a free electron. So now if we look at these collected electrons, what do we do with them? Well, this is a pixel uh, from a CMOS sensor and the electrometer, this capacitor that measures the amount of charge is adjacent to the pixel and you'll see more of that later. So how do we get those electrons out of here? Well, if you notice here, there's a barrier. This is blue and the electrons really don't want to go there. They want to stay here. But if you would apply a, a positive voltage to this electrode here, you can push the barrier down and the electrons are now free to move to the other side where they can be measured. So let's now look at a CCD. So CCD uses, as I mentioned, all of these concepts, all of these um, 
you know, phenomena. And CCD is an acronym for charge coupled device. It's really this charge transfer that we talked about earlier. It's impractical in a CCD, more or less, to try to measure the charge at every pixel, have an electrometer at every pixel. You'd have all these conductors coming out of the device, and you'd have to figure out how to, you know, get these conductors out, attach analog to digital converters to them, et cetera. It's much, much easier really just to move the charge instead of trying to get wires out of the device and measure at each pixel. And so in, in the traditional CCD device, the charge is um, transferred down one row at a time and then moved out to an electrometer here. There's an amplifier and then an A to D converter and each pixel then produces you know, data that can be read and transferred to the computer. And so the readout of a CCD, CCD typically looks like this. So let's look at the limitations of CCDs. So both CCDs and CMOS imagers are fabricated in what's called a MOS process, metal oxide semiconductor. The metal being like the electrode, like we showed in the previous slide, the oxide being a thin layer of um, insulator and the semiconductor, essentially the silicon beneath it. And really it, it refers to the construction of transistors and other you know, uh, devices that you can fabricate on the chip. And going back to dopants, there's two types of transistors that you can, that you can create, uh, N-channel and P-channel. Um, both CCD and CMOS imagers require complex digital logic systems to operate them. You know, you've got counters uh, to do the kind of choreography of moving these charges like you just saw with the CCD. There's a complex interaction of vertical and horizontal clocks that have to be uh, carefully uh, created. You've got analog to digital converters, you've got controllers, etc. So there's an enormous amount of logic that's required for either type of device. Um, but on a CCD, we run into a fundamental problem, and that is we can only use one kind of transistor on a CCD. And I'm not gonna go into the details, but basically if you can consider the transistor as kind of the fundamental element in order to create logical functions, AND gates, OR gates, counters, A to D converters, they have a significant problem in that um, when you try to control something else with this transistor, if you turn it on, it has to go through a current limiting device, which slows down the turn on time. When you turn it off, on, on the other hand, and sh close this resistor, you can turn it off quite quickly, but the problem is then you dissipate a lot of power with this transistor or with this resistor. And so the issue here is twofold. One is that there's a significant amount of power that's in a sense wasted by these logic gates or these switches, um, and also they tend to be fairly slow. And as a result, you can't really integrate a whole lot of logic on board, which means all of that logic has to be done off chip, which takes longer to design, um, is a greater cost, it's higher power consumption in general, and overall makes the camera larger. You have to put a lot of effort into getting all of these external components to be um, compact enough. So now let's look at the CMOS sensor. You know, what's different about a CMOS sensor? Well, one of the major differences in the C in CMOS, it's a complementary MOS. So in, in CMOS device, you use two types of transistors, N-channel and P-channel whereas the CCD only uses the N channel. And as a result, you can create a similar switch, but instead of having a resistor up here that's dissipating a lot of power, if you notice in each one of these states, whether the load is off or whether the load is on, one of these transistors is open, which means essentially no current flows through this, which means the power consumption is much, much less. There's a very, very brief period where one of these is closing and one of these is opening, where you'll get a little bit of pulse of, of current down through here. But the push-pull configuration opens up tremendous capabilities. It also makes the turn-on time and turn-off turn off time pretty much the same. They're not exactly the same. So that allows the logic to be sped up. And as a result, 
of this push-pull configuration, you can now integrate an enormous amount of functionality on chip. Now, this CMOS, you know, bipolar push-pull configuration has been used in the kind of conventional logic, CPUs, gates, and all of that for decades. But the problem for imaging is that many of the advances and the um, uh, technologies um, and you know process developments that were really, really good for speeding up logic and for miniaturizing logic wasn't necessarily conducive to imagers or imaging. And as a result, the early CMOS devices were really, really um, pretty bad uh, in terms of their performance. In the last decade or so, much of that has changed. And the quality of these devices, the CMOS devices, has in some cases really even surpassed CCDs. Um, each technology has its advantages and disadvantages. CCDs are still really beautiful devices in terms of you know, the ultimate performance that you can get out of them. But practically speaking, uh, for most applications, CMOS devices have um, essentially eclipsed, not, not just in terms of performance, but, but also in terms of just their uh, practical applications. So we can now integrate an enormous amount of, of uh, complex high-speed functions. And just as an example, hopefully you can see this, but this is a CMOS device, and this area here is the um, photosensitive area, the array of pixels. And if you notice, it's shared with some other structures down here. This is all the logic, A to D converters, everything else. And essentially, you can have more or less a camera on a chip um, with, with this technology. In contrast, here's a CCD, kind of a, a similar resolution. And as you see, the imaging area takes up most of the chips. Really, all of this area here is devoted to wire bonds. It's an indication that there's very, very little that is integrated on chip. So next, uh, let's look at um, CMOS sensor function. So how does it, how is it different? How does it read out different? Well, as we mentioned, it's highly integrated. So now we have A to D converters, and actually you can have up to an A to D converter per column of pixels. So imagine if you had, you know, an HDTV resolution imager, you know, you would have potentially 1900 of these A to D converters, where as in the CCD camera, we only had one. Um, each pixel next to it has an electrometer and a very simple amplifier. And these are all connected to buses that go down to the column A to Ds. And then the readout is basically one row is selected at a time. The, the charge is transferred, as I showed you earlier, to the electrometer. It's amplified and the voltage gets impressed upon each column A to D converter. So the entire row is digitized simultaneously. That data is quickly moved into essentially like a memory and then the data is shipped out in serial fashion. So as we read out row by row, we have this serial and, and very high speed readout. And so depending on the device architecture, um, faster frame rates are possible because the CCD charge transfer is in general slower than just moving a bunch of data out of a memory location. So not to put too fine a point on it, but here's an example of our eight megapixel CCD sensor. It's large uh, because the pixels are relatively large, but it's about it's eight, eight megapixels. And you can see all the circuitry outside. These are two A to D converters, drivers, uh, power supplies, et cetera. And there's even more on the backside. Uh, I, I know this board very well. In contrast, here's a similar resolution CMOS device. Um, and as you can see, relatively little componentry on the outside it can be much smaller um, and much less expensive. So now let's move on to camera selection criteria. So what do you need to consider if you're if you want to purchase a, a digital camera? Well, first and foremost, you want to consider resolution. If you have an imaging system, you know, an optical system, you know, Ideally, you would want the optical system to be the limit of your resolution, not your camera. 
And in any optical system, um, resolution is ultimately limited by diffraction for all intents and purposes. So imagine a telescope, you're uh, pointing the telescope up to a star, which can be considered an infinitesimal point of light. When that star is projected onto something, a camera, your eye, um, a piece of paper, uh, it will not be a point anymore. It will be basically a, a blob. And if the aperture in your uh, telescope is circular, and let's say the star was monochromatic, it was a pure blue or a pure red, um, you would result in what's called, the, the point would turn into what's called an airy disk, which is kind of like a Bessel function-like shape, where you have a central peak and then you have these side lobes that come out. And this is a useful kind of guide for saying, well, what's my minimum uh, resolvable distance? You know, how close together can these two points get? And there are a number of them. There's the Rayleigh limit, which says um, basically um, if the, the minimum resolvable is when the peak of one matches the minimum of the other. But there are others. There's the Abbey, uh, Sparrow, and these are used in astronomy where you can bring very, very powerful um, analytic techniques to resolve what would otherwise look like something like this. If you, if you look here, you can easily discriminate those two stars. If the two stars were closer together, that's getting a little bit harder. This is probably where, you know, this looks like where you'd be at the Rayleigh uh, limit. And then here, they're even closer together. But you know, if you had the right analytic techniques, you could say, well, this is wider than uh, a single point spread function or a single area disk. So it looks like there's two stars there. So this is just a guide. Uh, it's, there's no, you know, there's no um, strict rule here. But what it gives you is it says, okay, you've got this minimum resolvable distance for your optical system. What do I do with this? How do I use this to determine what kind of camera I want? Well, now consider these two point spread functions or airy disks um, projected upon a sensor. Ideally, what you would want is you would want to have three pixels within this minimum resolvable distance R, because then you could pick up one peak, you could pretty much measure the trough between them and then the other peak. Now let's say you couldn't, the pixels in the camera you want were much smaller. Well, you, you can use that, all right, but really, in a way, you're kind of throwing away resolution. You're oversampled because you have many more pixels than you really need in this minimum resolvable distance R. It's not necessarily a terrible thing. Uh, you may be forced to do that because there's no there's no um, sensor that uh, ideally matches this. But just know that there you know there can be what's called empty resolution. And then if the pixels are too large. Um, it becomes difficult to resolve. You could with, you know, say, well, uh, these these two pixels are, are you know, have a fair, fairly high signal level, so it looks like there are two uh, points here. But on the other hand, this is an ideal alignment of these functions with these pixels. If you could imagine just a random uh, positioning of these, there may be certain uh, kind of geometries or, or orientations where it would be hard to discriminate. So keep in mind this, you know, um, the pixel size should be related to this function here. So again, Rayleigh criterion and the Nyquist sampling are a guide. There can be any number of things that will really change that non-ideal behavior. Um, you know, the point spread function might be larger because of aberrations, misalignment, tolerances, et cetera. Um, and so you may actually be able to go to larger pixels because you don't have a perfect optical system and you might not be working at only one wavelength. All of these things, if you have white light, that will tend to make the point spread function larger. And so you might need, you might reason that you could go to larger pixels. On the other hand, if you have a lot of <clears throat> other effects like flare and dust or poor contrast, you might even want to go back to this um, oversampling. Uh, sorry, it's not going backwards. You might want to go back to an oversampling situation so that you can get more pixels uh, to measure this very poor contrast between peaks and troughs. <clears throat> 
keep in mind also that there's a trade off between pixel size and light sensitivity. So, you know, the, the amount of photons that you collect is proportional um, to the area. And so as the pixel size gets smaller, you go to higher and higher resolution, um, your sensitivity is going to be lower, all else being equal. Now you can get around that a bit by doing what's called binning, where you sum uh, neighborhoods of pixels to create essentially super pixels. Now in a CMOS device, most CMOS devices can't do binning in the charge domain. They can't sum the charges together, the electrons together. So the binning has to be done off chip. The result of that is there is a noise penalty because each pixel is being measured, noise is being introduced to that pixel, and then you're summing the noise when you sum all of the uh, signal. But on the other hand, the signal actually wins. The signal increase in signal is greater than the increase in noise. So in general, binning can be um, uh, you know, a way to create larger pixels essentially. Sorry, my running into technical difficulties here. There we go. So now let's move on to array size. So with all else being equal, given pixel size, you know, same device, let's say, but in a in a larger format, the more pixels, obviously, the larger the field of view, the larger area that you can image. Um, but there are costs to that. Generally, if you have a larger imager, um, you'll have a larger die size. And in general, as a kind of rule of thumb, you know, the area of the die uh, is proportional to the cost or vice versa. Not strictly speaking, but in general. Also, you have more pixels to read out. And so if between two devices, they have the same um, number of pixels per second in terms of their readout. Obviously, if you have more pixels, it's going to take longer to read out that frame and your overall frame rate is going to go down. Now, you can mitigate this to some degree by using a region of interest. Uh, for most of our cameras, you can select a certain region and only read out that region. Because you're reading out fewer pixels, uh, the frame rate is commensurately higher, but it's not perfect. There's some overhead involved in doing region of interest, so you can't get back to the equivalent of having just a smaller array. So next, another important one is color. Um, how is you know color uh, sensed on one of these sensors? Well, basically, if if for for all of our cameras, if there's a color in monochrome option uh, available, really the base sensor is the same. It's just that the color sensor has deposited upon it um, um, red, green, and blue absorptive filters. And you can see that each pixel has one of those absorptive filters. In this case, this is what's called the Bayer pattern. It's our Bayer pattern as some pronounce it. It's a very, very popular pattern and in some degree kind of mimics um, the spectral selectivity of the human eye. <clears throat> There's more greens than there are reds and blues. But because essentially you're distributing these colors amongst the available uh, pixels, you are going to suffer some loss of resolution. If you think, if you look at, let's say, this red pixel here, well, what's the green and blue values there? You don't know because there's only a red pix or a red filter on this pixel. So in order to determine the green and blue, you have to estimate it from the neighbors. The neighbors are spatially you know, distant or more distant from this red pixel. And as a result, when you do this estimation, you're essentially blurring the image. So a color sensor, a single chip color sensor like this will always come at a cost of resolution. The other issue too is that the filters themselves um, are absorptive and that means they're lossy. They don't, they don't have 100% transmission at their peak transmission, particularly in blue. And so you suffer some sensitivity. And then ultimately, you also get very strange aliasing effects. Um, you know, this is moray patterns that are introduced because you're doing this. The red sampling grid is offset from the green and the blue. And the result of that is the moray will be um, at different phases and be this kind of strange colored moray pattern. <clears throat> 
So now let's move on to noise. So noise is the variation in pixel value due to natural physical phenomena. And we're gonna talk about two different types of noise. Uh, read noise, which is really electronic noise. It's introduced by all kinds of components in the system. Um, and shot noise or photon shot noise, which is really a result of the natural variation in the number of photons that are collected. The read noise we can do something about, uh, the shot noise we can't. We typically express noise as standard deviation. Um, you know, in, in, from a statistical standpoint, you know, you may be tempted to, to look at noise in terms of its variance, but standard deviation really correlates more with the impact of noise, um, you know, on, uh, on both um, uh, the human visual system as well as in analytical um, techniques. And then finally, signal to noise ratio is often used, uh, which is really just the mean signal over the standard deviation of the noise. So let's first look at read noise. So read noise is electronic noise, as I mentioned, and there's many, many different sources of read noise in a chain of, um, of processes from measurement of the electrons with the electrometer all the way through to an analog to digital converter. So this is a kind of crude diagram that shows the electrometer and the, um, the electrons being collected, a voltage is produced. Let's say right there we have a little amplifier um, or buffer and noise is being introduced there. Then let's say we have a programmable gain amplifier with a gain we represent as G. Um, we might have additional noise introduced in that amplifier. And then finally, analog to digital conversion where we might have even more noise. And the result of that is that the noise ultimately is, <clears throat> is uh, the sum of uh, the root sum of squares. So the noise is, is summed together in that, um, in that fashion. And as a result, then we can have many contributors to the noise. And um, we, on the other hand, have the capability of, let's say, addressing that noise at different stages through certain design techniques. Now, if you were to just compare, let's say, two cameras with two different gain stages by just measuring the standard deviation in terms of the digital numbers that come out. If they have two different gains, and let's say you don't really know what those gains are, if you do that comparison, you know, you may find that one has a higher standard deviation than the other, and you may reason, well, uh, that must be, uh, means that camera is more noisy. But the problem is you don't know what that gain is. And so in order to do a fair comparison between cameras, uh, we do what's called input referral. We have some techniques that we use to establish what the overall gain of this entire or amplification factor of this entire chain is. And then we essentially invert that and uh, express the standard deviation in terms of electrons. And so for most digital cameras that you see out on the market, you will see if they publish a read noise, you'll see it in terms of read noise in electrons. The lower the number of electrons read noise, uh, the better. Then there's photon shot noise. So this, this is really a fundamental, uh, unavoidable, um, kind of random um, exposure, to spo to exposure to exposure or pixel to pixel variation in signal level. And it's really due to photon arrival statistics. Um, if you had three, pixels, let's say next to each other, they had exactly the same average photon, number of photons falling onto them uh, with exactly the same exposure interval. You know, they're collecting for, let's say, you know, one tenth of a second. Everything was exactly the same. It turns out that there still will be potentially a difference in the total number of photons that are collected um, in each pixel. And I can illustrate that here. So here we have photons falling into these three pixels being converted to electrons. You know, once that process is done, because those photons fell randomly, you wouldn't expect exactly the same number of photons uh, or to have fallen or electrons to have been produced. It might happen, but it's unlikely it'll happen. So the statistics behind this are Poisson statistics, and they, there's a very important relationship uh, for a, a Poisson distribution, which is that the mean is equal to the variance. And so 
as you increase the number of photons or the number of electrons you collect as your signal gets stronger and stronger, the variance actually increases with the mean. So you might think, well, that's really bad. I mean, I don't want to keep increasing my variance. But remember that we really measure the impact of noise in terms of standard deviation, which is the square root of the mean. So in the end, the noise that the noise increase, this is let's say the noise increase here in terms of standard deviation, and this is the signal level in electrons, the noise is increasing more slowly than the signal. So the upshot is more signal is better. So to look at this from an imaging perspective, consider this simulation. So we have a test image and let's consider this to be noise free. And now let's look at a simulation where we only have one photon per pixel on average. So the shot noise then would be the square root of one. The shot noise would be the mean is one. So the variance is one and the standard deviation is the square root of one. And so our shot noise, photon shot noise is equivalent to one electron. And as you can see, you, you know, you can make out an, an image here uh, with analytic techniques or with, you know, um, uh, machine vision, um, machine uh, artificial intelligence, you, you may be able to pull out a real relatively good signal. But now let's introduce read noise. So let's say we look at a camera that has five electrons read noise, which gets added to that. <clears throat> with five electrons read noise at this very, very low signal level, the read noise essentially swamps the shot noise and pretty much renders the image unusable. But now let's increase to 10 photons per pixel. Our shot noise now is 3.16 electrons. Remember, it's the square root of the variance. Now we're starting to get a much better signal and our read noise is becoming less important. If we go to 100 photons, even more so, our read noise is becoming now much less important. And even though our shot noise is increasing, the signal is increasing uh, faster than the shot noise and the image is starting to look better. A thousand photons, you probably can't see the difference. And a thousand photons is about a tenth of the maximum number of photons of the of the of one of our sensors that has um, the the lowest uh, total number of electrons possible collectible. And so the message here really is if you're working in a domain where you have plenty of light, don't worry so much about read noise. You know, there are very low read noise cameras out there, including our own Quantalux uh, SCMOS camera. Um, but you're going to spend more on that. And if you're not in that low light domain like this, why spend a lot of money on a very, very low read noise camera? So that concludes the major criterion uh, for selecting a digital camera. And uh, what I thought I would do is just for the next section, quickly go through uh, some of our uh, core competencies here. First, I'd like to talk about our camera design principles. Really, one of the fundamental principles of ours is first, do no harm. If the device is capable of any number of, uh, you know, uh, functions and performance characteristics, um, try to meet them, don't, don't degrade them. Read noise is a, is a, is a very, very important one. Uh, we always measure the read noise in our designs. Uh, it's very easy uh, to uh, degrade read noise if you're not careful in the design. And so that's one of the first things we do when we get a new sensor up and running is measure the read noise and make sure that it is uh, essentially the same as what the manufacturer specified. Uh, frame rate, that's another one. Some of these sensors can go very, very fast and actually exceed the capability of USB 3.0, uh, but we do our best to try to maximize frame rate. Problem with frame rate is, you know, these, these images are going to Windows or Linux uh, machines that typically uh, have their own limitations. And often the machines have a hard time keeping up even with USB 3.0 at full throttle. The other thing we uh, try to do is provide abundant interfaces, software and hardware. You know, we want to make these cameras as easy as possible uh, to integrate into your software and to integrate into your optical system, particularly particularly if you're using uh, Thor Labs components. 
And so, you know, as we kind of discussed earlier, we have C mounts. Um, some of our cameras have adjustable C mounts. You take the C mount out, then we have our SM1 threading for the tubes, which is over here. This is an example of an SM1 tube. You can mount a C mount lens to it. You can mount a cage mount to it. We also uh, are capable of custom and OEM solutions. We do this pretty routinely. Uh, this is a camera, this high speed um, camera that was used in a um, certain material science application and went into a vacuum chamber. Uh, this is for an internal project, uh, basically takes our Kirolux camera and reconfigures it with different circuit boards in order to fit into this very compact form factor uh, for this particular application. We can do custom enclosures, custom electronics. You know, we can change the firmware and FPGA code uh, within reason uh, to suit a particular uh, application. Another really important uh, technology we have is hermetically sealed um, cooling chambers. So I didn't really get into another source of noise uh, called um, dark current. Um, well, dark current is it creates a source of noise, but as the sensor is increased in temperature, um, a kind of parasitic noise is introduced or, or increases along with it, which is called dark current. And it, it can create its own issues, uh, can create bright pixels. Uh, it can also create its own level of shot noise. Um, and so in some applications where the image is very, very dim or the object is very, very dim, and you really wanna do longer exposures, you don't want the, to be collecting this additional source of noise. And one way to get around that is to cool the chip. And so we have in-house um, TEC cooling, a thermoelectric cooling capability. We put the chip on top of a thermoelectric or Peltier cooler. Um, we then put that assembly into a chamber. We evacuate the chamber to dry it out, introduce a dry gas. This is all sealed with um, either solder or laser welded hermetic sealing and then leak tested down to one times 10 to the ninth atmosphere CCC seconds, which is is very, very low leak rate. And as a result, you basically get years of operational life from this. The reason we have to put it into this chamber is if you didn't, um, a sensor at zero degrees C would most certainly uh, frost up uh, due to ambient humidity. So they have to be in a sealed hermetic dry chamber. The, the other kind of rule of thumb we use uh, is that we try to avoid fans. So our cooled cameras, they have large heat sinks, but on the other hand, they don't have a fan and fans introduce vibration. If you think about, let's say, doing a one second exposure because your, your uh, sample is very dim, uh, you don't want a fan running and essentially vibrating it and blurring your image at the same time. They also represent a maintenance issue as well. We offer a camera with uh, no faceplate. If you're doing, um, have, have a laser application uh, or other coherent light application, a piece of glass with parallel uh, faces can introduce all kinds of interference effects where basically this coherent light is being reflected back and forth and interfering with itself and causing all kinds of havoc in the image. So a natural inclination is let's get that glass away from the sensor. The problem is, is if you take the glass away, you're, you're exposing the sensor to the elements, uh, particularly particles um, and, and humidity. And as a result, you can damage the sensor, not so much with humidity, but with particulates. If you get particulates on it, it's very, very difficult to clean these. And so it's important to protect the sensor from dust and debris. And what we use is Thor Labs wedge window. The wedge window basically has one face that is not parallel. And as a result, when the coherent light comes in, it's um, essentially kind of bounced away from itself. And as a result, you avoid these interference effects. And finally, um, Thor Labs optical coating. You know, we have tremendous optical coating capability um, as well as other um, kind of synergistic um, uh, capabilities in optomechanics. So we have a wide range of stock filters available. Um, we have 
a two camera mount, which allows you to uh, have a beam splitter, let's say a dichroic or a neutral beam splitter, have two cameras imaging two different, um, let's say wavelengths. You can then align them both rotationally and translationally to get those images perfectly aligned. And then our software supports the display and overlay of the two images. Also, uh, in another business unit, we have a multivariate optical computing. Um, this is basically creating a filter that is based on the um, spectral reflectance of a particular compound. So let's say there's some compound that you're uh, very, very interested in, an explosive, a drug. You can measure the reflectance characteristic, and then using their, their sophisticated analytic techniques, you can create a filter um, transmission spectrum that will tend to essentially highlight these components. So you may have two powders that look very, very similar to the human eye, but when you put the filter in front of this camera, only one of them shows up more brightly. So these can be used in many applications where there's um, the desire to detect uh, one element or one um, uh, compound or another. And that is the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you very, very much for your time. And uh, we'll start looking at Q&A. Perfect, thanks Marty. Um, so it looks like the first question we have here is what makes a camera scientific? Uh, everything discussed here seems to apply generally to any camera. Well, there are a number of factors. Uh, one, it, let's, let's use uh, as an example, a cell phone camera. So in cell phone cameras, one important aspect is that they, they're trying to get as many megapixels as they can because that's a kind of a marketing, um, you know, a, a marketing advantage. But at the same time, they want to keep the cost and the size of the sensor down. So what that does is it, it, it forces them to make the pixels very, very small. At this point, you know, pixels are on the order of one micron, some of the smallest pixels. They're so small that they capture very little light overall. And so as a result, you get a, the raw signal coming off of them is quite noisy. And you also have to do a lot of post-processing in order to deal with this noise. Now, there's remarkable uh, capability. I mean, the Apple iPhone is a, is a perfect example of like just remarkable image processing that's done. But in quantitative Im applications, you don't really want to do that kind of image processing. So what we do is we deliver uh, raw data, typically, um, and that data is digitized at a fairly high precision, you know, depending on the camera, anywhere from 10 uh, to 14 bits. So it's that kind of raw quantitative precision with larger pixels, which really, uh, in a sense, defines what a, um, what a scientific camera is. It's more of a quantitative camera. Thanks, Marty. Uh, the next question we had, um, as pixel size decreases, is the well capacity decreasing proportionally or have the CMOS design been able to maintain the electron capture holding? Well, there, there is a relationship to that, but there's also a relationship to the well depth. And so as you scale a pixel size down, conceivably you could make the well depth, you know, deeper. To, to have a, a charge capacity. I mean, I'm not a device designer, but there are limitations there with CMOS devices. You know, all of the voltages are constrained, you know, by the kind of typical logic levels and other voltages that are applied. Whereas in a CCD sensor, you know, you have, you apply those voltages externally and you have a much, much wider range of voltages. And some of these voltages essentially are, um, define the limits to your well, well depth. So I would say there's a there's a relationship there. You can probably um, mitigate that to some degree, but eventually you're going to have limits. Okay. Um, another question: What is the procedure to measure shot and read noise over time to check if the camera's quality has degraded? Well, what we use well, shot noise is really you know is is a is is due as I mentioned to really the interaction of light or the arrival statistics of light. So shot noise shouldn't change over time, all else being equal. Um, 
in terms of read noise, that really also shouldn't degrade over time. I mean, it's it's possible that there might be some kind of you know aging phenomena going on, but one the way we uh, calculate read noise, which is uh, the same as uh, let's say the EMVA standard, is using what's called the photon transfer curve, and that also exploits. By the way, it's a really great method. It exploits the Poisson uh, relationship between uh, shot noise and uh, and the mean signal level. So what you do is you have a series of exposures uh, at different levels. You measure the mean value and the variance. You plot that from the slope of that. You can determine the gain, and then from there you can compute the read noise. It's a really elegant uh, technique and very quite simple actually. So you could do photon transfer curve um, calculations, you know, during the lifetime of the camera and see if things change. <clears throat> Um, is there any similar mechanism like electron multiplication that is used in CMOS sensors? Hmm. Not that I'm aware of. It would be difficult because the CMOS architecture has the uh, electrometer adjacent to the pixel and generally electron multiplication requires, you know, a number of stages, basically the transfer of um, of the charge packet under increasing electric fields in order to you know generate that electron multiplication so it would it would seem to be kind of contrary to to the fundamental uh, architecture of a CMOS device but I don't know there, there may be that capability somewhere okay. um, when you compare CCD and CMOS sensors how is the ratio between photosensitive area and the area occupied by push-pull transistors and amplifiers. Is this electronic circuitry adjacent to the photodiode? Yes, it is. And the, you know, the difference uh, in what you would call fill factor, um, let's say between a CCD and CMOS device would really depend on the particular device. You know, you may have devices that have older devices that have, you know, uh, uh, smaller fill factors, meaning that the photosensitive area is less. Um, but, you know, there's been a lot of advances as well. Uh, that's certainly something they try to minimize. Uh, one way to, to mitigate that is to put um, a micro lens array, basically a small kind of pillow like lens in front of every sensor. Um, that's done routinely as most sensors. Um, you know, front illuminated sensors have micro lens arrays on them. And what the micro lens does is even if you have light that's falling, let's say, you know, uh, perpendicularly away from your photosensitive area, the micro lens will tend to channel that light into the photosensitive area. It has its limitations for sure, but it is quite effective. Um, another way to, to mitigate that is to go to a backside illuminated sensor where all of that kind of intervening or a kind of competing electronics at each pixel is now on the other side and you're illuminating through the backside. Those sensors tend to be more expensive because there's additional processing that has to be done to the die or to, to the wafer. All right. Um, what about two photons combining to produce an electron hole pair at longer wavelengths? Well, that's done routinely, you know, in fluorescence microscopy. Um, I don't think silicon has. Um, at least a practical ability to do that. I'm not sure. I, I, I would expect that if, if there was, if silicon was able to do that, it is indirect band gap, but if, if there was, if it was able to do that, um, it would be exploited by now. But that, that's actually a really good question. Um, are there any fundamental trade-offs, uh, for example, sensitivity noise, as cameras go to higher pixel resolutions, any reason to deliberately choose a lower resolution? Um, yeah, yes. And let's say an, one example would be uh, the difference between, let's say, this our CS two uh, thirty five, which is a two point three megapixel sensor, with um, uh, I think it's five ish micron pixels versus uh, the CS505, which is a five megapixel camera with um, 3.45 uh, micron pixels. Uh, 
you know, at the lower resolution, you're getting a larger pixel size. Um, and that means you can collect more photons and ultimately, you know, arguably its sensitivity is higher. The, the issue though is, is that particular sensor has higher read noise. So the CS235, even though it has larger pixels, has higher read noise. And when you do the math, it turns out that they're, in terms of signal to noise ratio, they're nearly equal. So yes, uh, that there can be implications to that, um, but it really depends on other characteristics of the sensor. Okay. Um, when the laser intensity is high enough, uh, I can see the 1300 nanometer laser spot using a CCD or CMOS. What kind of effect is this? A, a 1300 nanometer? Correct. So when, uh, the, you know, when the intensity is high enough at 1300 nanometers, mm -hmm. um, they can see some sort of spot on the sensor. Well, it, it's just probably due to the intensity and the fact that, you know, the electron hole pair generation, you know, it's, it's statistical. And so it would be possible, even though silicon is, you know, quite transparent at that point or at that wavelength, it's possible to um, every once in a while generate an electron hole pair, you know, in the vicinity of that uh, electrostatic potential that I was talking about in the vicinity of the pixel. So that's probably what you're seeing is the kind of, you know, low probability, but non-zero probability of generating an electron hole pair. Now that is a long wavelength and potentially beyond the band gap. So that's, uh, yeah, it would depend on the, bandwidth of that um, that incident illumination. It's a good question. I'd have to know more about the, the, the particular um, laser and its spectral characteristics. Okay. Um, it looks like we're a little over, but we've got one or two more. Um, in a rolling shutter CMOS, does each row truly start and stop integration simultaneously or is there a, a subtle time difference between pixels? Well in a rolling shutter the the start and stop time like let's say you select a particular exposure time um, will will be different you know the first row will start integrating then the next row will start integrating then the next row will start integrating and then once the exposure time has been reached in the first row, that will stop integrating. And then the next row will stop integrating. And so essentially you're kind of moving down the device. You're moving a kind of aperture, um, you know, a, akin to the old SLR shutters, the, the um, curtain shutters in an SLR. Excellent. All right, so um, we're, we're heading uh, a little bit over, so we want to be conscious of um, of everybody's time. Um, so I think yeah, that was um, yes. Yeah, so we've got one more. Um, CMOS sensors have been in development for 25 plus years. What has been the technology breakthrough that is now that now allows CMOS sensors to compete with CCD sensitivity other than cost? Well, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's it's really you know advances, and I'm sure some of them are proprietary um, in in um, image quality, particularly dark current and read noise. Um, there are any number of fabrication um, and process techniques that could be brought to bear. Uh, one of the things, uh, is, as far as I can tell, that I think the industry had to deal with was early on, and you know, I was in the industry back when there was a lot of uh, excitement about the possibility of using a standard logic process for imagers. So let's say you're building memory or you're building a CPU, like let's throw an imager on there too, and we can, you know, we can um, uh, use our existing capital equipment and, and processes to do that. I think that was fairly quickly extinguished, you know, that 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 hope because of the kind of conflict between uh, 
um, you know, some of the requirements for digital logic to be really, really high speed and really compact uh, versus what was required for imaging. And so I think all of these manufacturers had to develop a, you know, CMOS imager process that was, um, you know, different than the standard CMOS. And as a result, then they were free to be able to, to tweak and, you know, refine that process and get much better imaging performance. But I would expect every manufacturer does something slightly different, whether you're Sony or, you know, Tower or TSMC, et cetera. All right, well, thanks, Marty. Uh, appreciate the time to answer the yeah, questions. Thanks. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, you see the contact info. If anybody does have any uh, further questions um, for us about products or applications, um, you'll see the contact info for our OEM sales team here. And again, want to thank everybody for joining us today, um, and we'll see you at our next event. Thank you. Thank you.